Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lori Lutz, and I am so pleased to welcome you to our fourth in our 2019 Brown Bag Lunch Series. In January, you heard from Christine McMahon as she talked about risk and risk management. <clears throat> in February, you heard from Marsha and Aisha on women as leaders, and especially women as mentors. In um, March, you heard from Lori, um, from New Hampshire on peer support, and today you are going to hear from Robin Fisk on trends in social services and moving some of the vulnerable populations that we serve into managed care. I'm thrilled to announce that there's um, well over 140 individuals on the call today, and there's groups of folks from throughout the organization. And I really want to thank our champions for that. Our champions are individuals who have agreed to help us build the following for our brown bag lunches. And they are throughout the country, and they help bring people together, and they set up rooms, and they facilitate conversations after and during the sessions, and they feed me questions during the brown bag lunch. And I'm so grateful to each of you. <clears throat> if you do have a question for Robin, please email me at l. Lutz, that's L-L-U-T-Z as in zebra, at fedcap.org. And I will integrate those questions into the ones that have been sent to me already this morning, and there's a lot of them. Um, obviously, the interest in what Robin has to say is great. So without further ado, let me introduce Robin. Robin is our Senior Vice President for Occupational Health. I first heard Robin speak about, my gosh, Robin, I bet it was three years ago now. <clears throat> you were presenting to our management and leadership team on just the concept of managed care and where it was going. And it was almost like you had a, a crystal ball in that what you said is exactly what is happening around this country. And managed care might sound like a dry topic, but boy, did Robin make it come alive. And so that's what Robin's going to do um, for us today. So Robin, without further ado, take it away. Wow, that's a tall order. Um, okay. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Um, now, I apologize to the folks in Leadership Academy because I keep um, saying every time one of you looks at your notes when you're presenting, you shouldn't be looking at your notes, but I'm afraid I'm going to do that today. So um, this afternoon, we're going to be discussing trends in social services, particularly as they relate to moving populations into managed care. Um, we're going to describe why we plan to move more into managed care than we already are and how we're going to do that. And we're also going to start to look at what makes an area or a market or a population favorable for this type of activity. Um, and I'm going to describe some recent research and what it means for the services we provide and the role that we're playing for our clients in the area, which is the space I'm talking about is the space between managed care and social services. And finally, I'll talk about how the FedCap group can get involved to solve some problems by becoming a trusted broker, which is a slightly different topic. So we're going to have kind of a right-hand turn toward the end of our presentation. And then I need to apologize. I have a flu that's turned into a chest cold, and I may burst out in coughing, but no matter what, I'm going to have a cough drop going. I'm going to have water going throughout this presentation, and I'm sorry about that. Um, it's just me talking today, so please break it up with any questions that you have. Um, I'm happy to have uh, – they're not. I don't consider them interruptions. I consider them um, – they'll liven up the conversation. So with no further ado, let's, let's launch into it. So as you know, FedCap grew out of the empowerment movement. The FedCap group was formed by disabled veterans after World War I who met while they were begging to try to support their families. And these were people that were living in the midst of the problem that they were trying to solve. So the FedCap group is not about charity. It, is always, it has always been about empowerment. Um, it has always been about not just serving the problem, but looking for ways to eliminate the problem, solve it, and then eventually prevent it altogether. And I hope to weave that philosophy of FedCap as trying to make the problems go away um, throughout our, com our conversation today. Um, so. Um, 
this, these are the people that we serve. Here's a, a list of the folks that we serve. Um, and when I'm out talking to insurance companies about the services that we provide, I say, we know how to engage the hard to engage. And typically the folks that we engage with are folks that don't necessarily want to be among our populations. Um, we're here to help them deal with un sometimes unpleasant aspects of their lives, particularly in areas with substance use, um, the, the justice involved. And we find a way, despite all of that, to engage them and to get them to participate in the service that we're providing. And the ability to do that is the secret sauce that will make us successful in moving into managed care further. So, uh, yeah, i got to get used to shifting these slides. Let me pivot a little bit here. Um, in the United States, most health care coverage is funded through one of two uh, vehicles, either private uh, commercial coverage, typically arranged for you by your insurance. So if you're full-time with FedCap, you have health insurance benefits from that are arranged for you and funded by FedCap. Uh, part of it is taken out of your paycheck. Part of it is contributed by FedCap for the cost of the premium. The other segment that, has, that provides and funds health care benefits are government programs. And the two big programs that are relevant to the populations we serve are Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is a federal program. It's what we call a contributory program. Um, among the deductions from your check are tax payments, well, prepayments that you're making toward the Medicare fund so that when you get to the point that you need Medicare coverage, you've already prepaid into it. So Medicare is a federal program for folks who are elderly and or disabled. It's paid for in part by our uh, uh, paycheck withholdings. We also pay premiums. Once we qualify for the program, most of us pay premiums for the benefits. And then we pay coinsurance for the benefits that we receive under the program. The other large federal health care program is Medicaid. This is not a contributory program. Medicaid is run jointly by the state and federal governments. The federal government sets basic rules, and then the state um, comes up with variations on those rules um, to tailor it to the needs within that state. The cost of the program is split between the federal and the state governments. Um, the amount of the split varies, but right now it is heavily, heavily funded by federal dollars. And Medicaid uh, program uh, pro coverage is available for low-income people and for categories of people determined to need coverage, including pregnant women and people with some disabilities. Um, what, one other thing about the, Fed, the Medicaid program is the federal government is looking at it very closely now as kind of a learning lab and they're granting waivers to some of the Medicaid requirements, allowing states to tinker with the program and to try new things and new approaches. And they're being watched closely, again, as learning labs to see what's working and to see what can be extrapolated into other markets. And when the Affordable Care Act was passed, states were initially required, but now it's become optional for states to extend coverage to able-bodied adults with income a little bit above the poverty line. And in many states, Medicaid also covers this new, what's called expansion population, which has distinct characteristics. These are folks that typically were previously uninsured and sometimes for very long periods of time. They tend to be unemployed and they tend to have very high medical needs. There's also a category of people that are considered, dual, that are called dually eligible, and those are folks that are eligible for both Medicare because of disability or age, and Medicaid because of low income. Uh, uh, and those, those are folks sometimes that are in long-term care facilities, but they are called the dually eligible. Um, and this, these two programs are the programs that cover the populations that we typically serve. And as health care costs and complexity has increased, purchases of health care needed a way to ensure that the care provided was the right care that was being provided at the right time by the, in the right setting. So for example, um, patients getting care from the emergency department rather than going to their primary care practitioner 
or patients who would who had a condition that they couldn't get diagnosed, so they would ping pong back and forth between various specialists. And so payers said, we need a way to organize this chaos. And uh, insurance companies formed, or, uh, the, first, the early ones were called health maintenance organizations, as ways to try to manage the care, both the cost and the delivery of the services. As healthcare became more complex and expensive, again, the employers started, were the ones that led the initiative to say, let's move into this managed care arena. Um, state Medicaid programs and federal Medicare programs soon followed suit. Managed care programs involved a health insurance company assuming responsibility for administering all of the covered services that a person is entitled to for a specified predetermined amount per month. So in other words, the insurance company is saying, this is a range of services that we're going to cover. And for the, the population that we're covering, whatever they need within this range, we'll provide it for a specific amount. So there, the insurance company has the skin in the game. And the old rule is, if whoever has the skin in the game is the one who determines the rules. So the managed care organization um, assumed responsibility for this, and they contracted with an employer, or for Medicaid, it would have been a state government, or for Medicare, the managed care company would contract with the federal government um, to pay for all of the services that their employees or enrollees or beneficiaries needed for that flat rate. Then the managed care organization would create a network, and the network would be hospitals, physicians, skilled nursing facilities, ambulance companies, pharmacies, providers of all of the services that were within the scope that they agreed to cover. And the network of providers would agree to several different things as a condition of being allowed into the network. First of all, they have to meet certain quality standards. Um, they would have to agree to not deliver services unless a referral had been provided by the member's primary care physician. And so this is where we introduced the concept of the gatekeeper, where the primary care physician would serve as the knowledgeable first point, point of entry into the healthcare system and would determine whether or not a referral was needed to a specialty care physician and what type of specialty care was needed. Other members of the network agreed that they wouldn't be providing services until the, unless a, a patient came with a referral. And then for certain complex or very expensive or sometimes medically questionable procedures, the insurance company would be involved with giving a secondary approval called prior authorization. And again, the specialty care providers and hospitals would agree that they would not provide those services unless a prior authorization had been provided by the insurance company. And then network providers, of course, accepted a pre-agreed rate um, and that rate would usually be a fairly significant discount off of their charges. So we had a system of checks and balances for the way that services were provided with a central control point trying to make sure that the services provided were medically necessary and appropriate. In managed care companies are regulated by state insurance departments, which is an area that I knew very well at the time. And um, they would also be looking at making sure that the care provided was adequate. So in other words, the insurance company may have an incentive to restrain or restrict care, but there were laws and inspections and audits that would make sure that that, in fact, did not happen. So using managed care allowed Medicaid programs to pass on to insurance companies a lot of the work and the responsibility for administering the program, and also the risk that their population would need more care than was included in the budget. Once they agreed upon a specific rate, it became the insurance company's risk management issue. And of course, state governments raise money through taxes. They have specified budgets to live with during the, through the year. So passing the risk off in the form of a premium, a fixed premium, was very desirable to insurance companies. From the insurance company's point of view, since they're making a bet, 
that they will be able to manage the care for a prepaid rate, they were most enthusiastic about um, managing the care of populations that they knew and understood very, very well. And so the populations that first were moved into managed care were people who had fairly stable lives and people who had predictable medical in, uh, conditions where the cost of the medical condition was understood, the treatment for the condition was finite and understood, and, um, and so that the insurance company was in a position of being able to understand and manage its costs fairly well. Since normal people are in the majority, managed care organizations were more readily able to know the care that they would need to provide and to predict. The people that were left outside of this, which were called carve-out populations, they were carved out from the majority that was moved into managed care, they stayed behind in the old state system and the state managed their benefits. And who were these people? Our people, of course. So the populations that we work with were the ones that were carved out. And now what's happening over time, that's starting to change as states get more data on these populations and have been studying them carefully, and as insurance companies have also been studying them carefully, these populations are starting to be carved into managed care. Um, and again, the reason Robin? folks... Yeah. Rob, and this is Lori. I have a question that just came about that. <clears throat> the question was, um, I've not had great experiences with managed care, and it worries me that the populations that we serve might enter into this managed care environment, which seems to me all about saving money. How might you respond to that? With my next slide. <laughs> um, well, actually, two slides down. Um, managed care can, make e can go either way, and we'll get to that in a second. It can either make the delivery of services more complex by creating more barriers, or it can smooth it out by creating a, a, an understanding pathway into getting the appropriate level of care. And so the, when these populations are carved into managed care, it's very important that the way that the services and, and the, the insurance is administered takes into consideration the needs and the barriers that our populations face. So stay tuned, because we'll be talking about that. So um, again, these folks were carved out because their cost of their care was unknown or unpredictable. And in some cases, such as with IDD, they, there was no recovery. These are chronic, ongoing conditions. And so the populations are making the transition right now into managed care. Many of them are already there. Something else, while well, I'm on my doom and gloom part, um, Something else has changed in healthcare that also is going to make it make it more difficult for the populations that we serve. Um, it used to be that you saw the same physician every time you needed care, and even if it was just for your annual physical, year after year you went to the same doctor. Chances are your family members went to that doctor as well, and so this doctor had knowledge of you, both your medical history, um, your family history, so that he, he or she, typically he, knew your, your social circumstances, knew the complications in your life, and had, had depth and breadth of knowledge of, your, of who you were and what you were, your life was like. That's changing. Healthcare has become increasingly fractured. Clinicians deal almost exclusively with the single complaint that brought you into the, the offices on that particular day, and they don't really have the time um, to look at patterns or look for patterns or to look for trends over time. And so healthcare is t turning from a long-term relationship to more of a transactional one. And then we all know that clinicians are under time constraints and productivity constraints in order to be sustainable in, this, in the current marketplace. And so that has, that has been one of the big factors that has contributed to um, uh, healthcare becoming more transactional and less long term. Um, and another thing that if, that affects it is that healthcare practitioner turnover has increased. Um, and so the, the chance, 
physicians are more likely to move from place to place and less likely to be at the same place for, the, for their entire career. And so again, this leads to the, a greater likelihood that the physician you see this year is not the one that you're going to see next year. And our populations don't do well in this environment. Our populations have um, chronic conditions that are very complex. They have families and family dynamics that affect their ability to comply. They have social barriers. They're very complex. And this is one more factor that contributes to our population not really doing well in this environment. So insurance, as I just said, and traditional health care have not significantly improved the lives of our, of our clients. And as these populations are moved into managed care, we're at a pivot point. Managed care can either increase the level of complexity, as Lori pointed out, and difficulty that our clients face to access care, or if done well and if redesigned for these populations, they can actually improve the care and provide it in a way that allows our patients to comply, or our clients to comply as patients. And as it turns out, as our populations are moving into managed care, managed care is changing for the better. Now, this is my cup is half full slide. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that's changing is that, um, there we go. We no longer assume the physician has the greatest influence over the patient. One of the things that we're learning is that we need to have trusted relationships um, with our patients and um, in the managed care environment we need to have people that may or may not be the physician. So that is starting to change over time. Care coordination, which is one of the secret sauces that I think helps, that can help managed care to work better. It is increasingly being paid for as a covered benefit, particularly for our populations. Um, not just, not just care coordination, but other benefits are being expanded, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but home and community-based services are being designed in a way that makes sense for our population. Although managed care companies have traditionally wanted to do care coordination themselves, and they consider it part of their core competency, studies have shown that that is not the most effective way to do it. In fact, studies, I don't know if studies have shown this, but it's annoying. Uh, to get a phone call from a phone bank asking you if you've had your mammogram or your flu shot or if you've filled your prescription with a mail order pharmacy. That really is not what's going to make the difference for our population. Studies have shown that care coordination is most effective if the care coordinator and the patient develop a trusting relationship. And this happens when they get a chance to meet face to face, when they get to spend time and it also happens when the care coordinator and the client have a shared background or a culture or a language. In fact, one study of a company called Iora Health that employed community health workers that basically took patients and turned them into community health workers and gave them training and put them to work in their medical practices. And um, they found that these folks that were drawn directly from the community and from the patient population were very effective working with um, non-compliant patients. And during an interview of one of the patients um, that was part of the study, the patient said, the, the interviewer said, you've been non-compliant with your medical treatment for, for months now. What was it about this, this uh, care coordinator that caused you to suddenly become compliant and start taking your medications, as we've been asking? And the person said, she sounds like my mom, you know. And so basically, uh, this was somebody that knew how to speak the right language to this particular person and how to, knew how to motivate them to become co a compliant patient. So again, the person with the closest, closest trusted relationship with the patient is in a position to influence his care, and there's growing recognition that the best place to look for that person is very close to them, meaning a peer or a community health worker or somebody drawn from their community. So, States have seen this research, too, and, and as an example, they're incorporating it into their Medicare request for proposals. New Hampshire is an example. They, in their most recently issued request for proposals for the Medicaid program, required insurance companies to purchase, um, to, to buy care coordination services 
for 50% of the care coordination they were going to provide from local care management entities. Um, and so, in other words, not Robin. Saying, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I know I'm interrupting your flow. I've just got three or four questions all zooming in here on the same topic. So I thought answer it when you're ready to answer it. But the question really is this. How is the FedCap group prepared to provide this kind of care management? Can you give an example of what this kind of care management might look like for the FedCap group? Do we have the skills? Do we have the expertise? Are we building that expertise? So there's just, I, I want you to, if you're going to spend time, spend a little bit more time on how we're preparing ourselves for that, because there seems to be a lot of interest. Sure. Um, so the, the state of New Hampshire is requiring insurance companies to buy 50% of their care management locally. In New Hampshire, we have a company called Granite Pathways. Granite Pathways operates a program called the Doorways Program <coughs> Excuse me. that is required by contract to do care management relate for folks who, are, who come to the doorway for assistance with substance use treatment. So there we are. We're, in, we're sitting. We're perfectly positioned to provide this service. And in fact, insurance companies are contracting with us to provide this service for the individuals who are purchasing insurance, who are getting their Medicaid benefits through them. So as you can see, that's a circumstance where we're positioned. We're pivoting from providing the services for one audience to providing it for the insurance company. And we're doing it from a place of knowledge because we already have experience with that community. If up in Rochester, we've been providing care coordination for folks um, with Medicaid care coordination for folks with developmental disability. Um, out of our workforce provisions, we do care coordination. It's not medically oriented care coordination, but we, when we bring someone in that is sent to us to for assistance in finding a job, the first thing we do is figure out what their barriers are to work, and then we start working with them to overcome those barriers. And the person who's doing that is very much doing care coordination. And the point of it is, is care coordination for our populations is not just did you get your flu shot, did you get your mammogram. It's much more about dealing with social barriers. Do you have transportation? Do you have daycare? Do you have, is the power on in your house? Do you have food in your house? And it's all of these types of things that we're already doing for these populations. So thank you for those questions. So. Among the research that's being done, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to switch gears here and talk a lot about research, but the healthcare industry is realizing that patients' living conditions have a much greater effect on their health than most of the medical treatments. And this slide I prepared for a presentation um, while I was in school a while ago where we were talking about um, social I interventions. And actually, what we were comparing is the amount of influence the rest of your life has compared to the amount of influence that your time with your physician has on your life. Um, and studies have shown that the zip code in which you were born is a strong predictor of your health. Now, that doesn't mean that your, your, your zip code is your destiny, but it does mean that it can be a predictor without interventions of what types of health issues you may face over the course of your lifetime. So, for example, if you're born into a food, food desert, that, will, that may affect childhood obesity. If you're born in a physician shortage area, it may affect your, your health care usage patterns. And Robin, what, what, Robin, what exactly do you mean by a food desert? A food desert is a place um, where grocery stores either never opened or they've shut down. And so the people living there don't have access to fresh fruit and vegetables fresh meat, and so what you find is that they have, there are, the only things that would be there would be um, stores, uh, convenience stores, stores offering sodas, sugared, heavily sugared sodas, potato chips, pastries, and, the, and so there really isn't access to healthy foods in those areas, and they're called food deserts. So the CDC, um, so the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, predicts that 50% of your health status is derived from the social and environmental characteristics of the places where you live. Um, you know, if you live in a home with lead, uh, if you live in a place where there isn't access to public transportation, these are all things that will that will determine your health 
probably to a greater extent than the conversation you had with your primary care physician. Other estimates are, are even stronger, showing um, that social, behavioral, and environmental factors contribute to more than 70% of certain types of cancer, 80% of heart disease cases, and the 90% of cases of stroke. Think hypertension. Think stress. So about 15 years ago, we began to study patients who were high utilizers of expensive medical care. And we were trying to figure out what turns somebody into a high utilizer, particularly where two patients who have the same medical diagnosis, one will become a high utilizer and one won't. And what the study showed was that the predictor of the high utilization obviously wasn't the medical condition but it was the social support that the person had available to them. And the, the, in, in this particular study, which was done by Emory University Hospital, um, the predictors were covered by Medicaid, which meant low income, covered by Medicare, which meant older and, and or disabled. It meant they, users of alcohol, tobacco, and other substances, homelessness and unemployment all correlated heavily with somebody becoming um, a high utilizer of healthcare services. And that makes perfect sense because illness doesn't occur by itself. It doesn't occur in isolation. And if you're a person who doesn't have adequate social supports to, to, to catch you, a, a safety net to catch you when you become ill, then suddenly the healthcare system becomes that safety net. If you don't have anybody to come to your home and pick up medications for you, or if you lose your lease while you're in the hospital, um, you're going to stay in that hospital, or you're not going to have medications that you need to keep you healthy when you leave the hospital. So again, the predictors of high utilization and high health care spending weren't the conditions themselves, but they were the social, con the social network in which the person existed. And here's some other research that I thought was interesting. Um, if you compare total government spending for health care and other social services in the United States with total spending in other developed countries, you'll see that in the United States we overspend for health care and we significantly underspend for other social services. Um, and we spend more for health care than these other countries do and, by the way, our, our life expectancy is shorter, so we're not getting the results that you would expect for the higher healthcare spending. So to be a little bit more specific, in the United States, for every dollar we spend on healthcare, we spend 56 cents on other social services and supports. The average in the other economic, in the other developed countries was for every dollar spent on healthcare, a dollar 70 was spent on other social services and supports. And so now in our industry, there's a big initiative going on to rebalance the spending. And there's a lot of research going into how do we do this effectively and how do we do this in ways that make sense. And here's some of the research that we found so far. Um, right now, research is flooding into this field of study. And we're finding that housing vouchers and energy assistance um, and the elimination of food deserts reduce obesity and childhood diabetes. That makes perfect sense. We're finding out that prenatal and infant nutrition reduce infant mortality and low birth rate. That makes huge sense. The third one was surprising to me. Early childhood education correlates to lower blood pressure in adulthood. And then income supports for older adults results in reductions in disability. So they are correlate to reductions in disability. So the large healthcare programs and health insurance companies are trying to encourage innovation on ways to address the social determinants, as they call it. Um, they're doing it as a way to reduce healthcare spending, but also, to their credit, they're doing it as a way to improve on patients' health. And this next slide. Robin? Yeah. Robin, there's a question. Um, how is technology woven into um, the, this integration of, of health care and social services and actually just managed care in general? I'm going to postpone that question and I'm going to put a place marker to, to answer that question um, and a few more slides down, but I'm going to keep going with this right now if you don't mind, Lori, because 
um, let me, because I want to stay on this research bent for a minute longer. So we're talking about people flooding in, dollars flooding into research and ways to address the social determinants of health as a way to lower health care spending. And these geese, I'm trying to show flocking here. Um, but I think that neither insurance companies nor health care systems should, are well positioned to lead this effort. Social services, I think, have to address the needs of the client and the source of the problem because and look beyond just addressing health care costs. Um, because I think funds are being spent on medically focused things or fixing part of the problem. And I think that that in the short run is not going to serve us well. So let me give you some examples of what I see as problems in this, uh, with the way that we're trying to address uh, the influence of social determinants on medical health and medical spending. The first example, recently within the last week, an insurance company went to the press to say that they were um, helping their insured people who were in food deserts by subscribing, subscribing to Amazon Prime for them. And so what they were doing was finding a way to get free food, to get free delivery of food into the homes of the people that purchased their insurance uh, who happened to be in food deserts. Um, they weren't educating them on what was healthy food. Um, they weren't paying for the food themselves and incentivizing them to buy healthy food. And they certainly weren't solving the problem for the rest of the people in the community that was a food desert that didn't happen to be covered by that same insurance company. So you see, they kind of took a myopic approach to the problem um, and, and left a lot of other people behind. Let me give a second example. There was a healthcare system that entered into a contract with an insurance company where they assumed responsibility for a lot of the cost of care. And um, the... Uh, so they noticed that some of their high spending people, they, they surveyed them and they said, why is it that you're coming to the emergency department, you're waiting until your health care needs become acute and you're very expensive at that point in time? And they said, well, I didn't have transportation to get there earlier, so I waited until I needed an ambulance and then I called an ambulance. And so this health care system made an arrangement with Lyft to bring people to medical appointments, figuring that a $200 primary care physician appointment and a $35 Lyft ride was a much more efficient way to deal with these people and to keep them medically stable than ha paying for an ambulance and an emergency department visit. But it didn't solve the problem of other folks in the community who also had transportation barriers, and it didn't solve the problem that these folks had with the transportation barriers they had to getting to grocery stores for good food, to getting out to community centers to reduce the amount of their social isolation. So it dealt with just the medical component of the problem, and I think that's the wrong way to go about addressing these. So I think providers and insurers are jumping in trying to help, and, and that's great, but I think that some of the fixes that they're looking for are somewhat quick fixes. And I think that they can contribute funding and they can contribute to stable funding sources for addressing these problems, but they alone cannot drive these solutions. And I think we're at a point in time when the social service agencies need to engage to drive for comprehensive solutions that are going to prevent problems moving forward. We need to look at ways to braid income streams. We need to look at ways to be able to solve problems for the community as a whole. And I think we have a role there. You know, we are well positioned to combine the relationships we have with our populations, with um, the data that we're gathering, with a, with a broad whole person view. And we, we have peer counselors and, and networks of social service agencies that already exist that can create um, a comprehensive solutions to some of these problems. So we're in a foot race. All around us, the healthcare industry is waking up to the fact that the social service agencies are actually the key to the problem, to solving the problem. But healthcare 3.0 requires that we have a seat directly at the table and not as subcontractors. We need to influence the choices that are made about the, the remedies that are provided. And I think FedCap Group's tube structure positions us well to deliver these services. We already have relationships with the clients, and we already understand their needs. 
So let me, okay, why is that not going? Let me pivot just a little bit and explain why I think we're in a very strong position to try to drive some of these solutions. And Lori, this is where I loop around to your question about technology and how we use technology in here. In some cases, we're the, we provide the clinical services. Another cough drop going in. Sorry, folks. Uh, we provide the clinical services directly, but more importantly, the way that we deliver those services, we develop deep engagement with the clients, with our clients, and with the special populations that are moving into managed care. We develop networks of social service agencies so that we can refer folks knowledgeably and make warm handoffs to the, and eliminate barriers to patients, our clients, getting services from these other agencies. We know how to do care management. We do it in a medical environment, but we also do it in non-medical non environments where we're following our clients to make sure that they follow through and that they get the other services that they need from the other agencies to make sure that our intervention is as successful as it can possibly be. We do referral management. We know that, that we have ways of knowing that the, the network providers that we refer to are going to treat our populations well. We poll our populations. We incorporate them into this process. Um, and we make them ambassadors for making sure that the referrals they get are good ones. We know how to run call centers. We know how to do outcome measures. We collect metrics that matter. We know how to enter into performance-based contracts. We have experience doing this with very large contracts. This is very rare among a lot of the social service agencies that we deal with, and we're, we're leaders in this area. We also are very good at billing multiple sources of payment. A lot of our contracts require that we bill co-payments, that we bill cost-based contracts, and that we bill insurance companies for the same episode of care. And we know how to do this. We have a strong revenue cycle management department um, that helps us to be sustainable, that helps us to build and collect for the bill and collect for the services we provide. We have a, compl a national compliance uh, committee and we have quality monitoring and auditing, auditing that are going in and doing chart audits. And we're seeing the results of these chart audits in cleaner reviews by outside agencies and accreditation agencies. We're good at this, and we're getting better. We have relationships with payers. We're getting onto their payer advisory committees. And we're having a greater voice at the table with them. That We, we will be growing that. We're going to be asking for your help to do that every chance we can. We have the resources and the scale to have financial uh, protections in place. And we are large enough, we have the financing behind us to be sustainable. And we manage and, and we grow sustainably. Sometimes it's a struggle, but we do it. We have the ability at all levels to interface with new Medicaid work requirements. And we have the ability to help insurance companies deal with this new, this new tax they have to deal with. And so, what we're seeing is insurance companies are, are now looking to deal with social service agencies. And a lot of social service agencies are not equipped to deal with them. We have the technology. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute. But we have single stop. We have the ability to get people into benefits and get people uh, expanded sources of services. We have the ability to track their care. We have um, FedCap Cares, which is a care management software. We have the ability to follow them and quantify our interventions. And eventually, we're going to be uh, um, publishing results showing the results of our interventions versus the population in general who don't get our interventions. And we'll be able to demonstrate the return on investment um, for our populations and for the services that we provide. We're going to have Robin, I don't know. Robin, I'm not sure if it's yeah. right now, but there's two things I want to make sure you fit in. Um, one individual asked, um, are we competing with for-profits who have a lot of the similar, um, yeah. you know, assets and, and financial strength? They wanted to, to better understand that. And, and um, the question came back again, I'm interested in looking at technological clinical services, not just data collection. There's technology to advance the health of an individual. And there was a question about that. So those are the two, if you can fit in, that would be great. 
competing with nonprofits. Every day with, with for-profits, we are competing with for-profits. And that's one of the reasons that why acquisition is part of our strategy for growth, is we need to get to a size where we have internal systems that allow us to have the type of data that we need um, to be able to, to compete with the for-profit organizations. Um, we, we have and we are enhancing our capability to compete with the for-profits in this area, um, doing it from a mission-based lens um, and we're, we're answerable to our clients primarily as our stakeholders and not to our shareholders. We think that, that we're in a better position to do this. And in a lot of time, in a lot of situations, we're worried about the conflict of interest that uh, for-profit companies can face. And we worry a little bit about um, whether the, the interests of the shareholders um, take precedence over the interests of the clients. And I don't mean to cast aspersions against for-profit. Sometimes they do things better and more efficiently. We need to make sure that we're studying them and, and learning how they do things and incorporating their successful practices into the way that, we, that we're doing business every single step of the way. But in terms of technological clinical interventions, that's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. I will say that we're using um, care coordination software that, is, that allows us um, to gather data um, um, on outcomes and compare uh, and look at what outcomes, quantify the outcomes. Was this a good referral for this type of a population and this type of, a, of, a met, of an underlying problem? Um, were referrals to this particular type of a, a social service agency successful? Why or why not? So we can get kind of a macro view on what worked and, one, and what didn't. In terms of technological, clinical, uh, interventions, um, some of the things that we're, work, we're moving into are telehealth as a way to expand. But I think that's really um, a little bit outside of where I want to drive with this particular presentation. We, we, but we do have a committee that is looking at implementing telehealth in one setting and then very shortly after that one, a second one. We are also looking at applications. Um, we have some folks at the Diagnostic and Treatment Center in Rochester that have some applications, tele, cell phone apps. Um, that folks are using to um, gauge mood and control behavior and anxiety. So these are some of the interventions that we're looking at. Again, not in my wheelhouse, and um, that might be a, a suggestion for another brown bag. But when we're looking at measuring return on investment, um, government funders are asking about uh, whether we are a good investment for them. Insurance companies are certainly going to be asking whether we're a good investment for their limited premium dollars. Um, and so we have to look at whether we measure quality of life or just cost spent versus cost saved. And again, I think we're in a good position to measure not just cost spent and cost saved, but overall improvement on the quality of the life um, for the populations we serve. And I think that insurers and providers have been measuring this a little bit too narrowly, looking almost exclusively at the healthcare spend. And if you do that, you can achieve savings, but you can sometimes achieve it by shifting costs elsewhere. And one example that we've seen is, you know, health, uh, mental health services that are being provided. Um, if there's too much savings in mental health services or if there's too much, uh, uh, somebody is released from a, a substance use treatment too soon. Um, you have savings in the medical side, but then you have an, a huge cost somewhere else in the system. Maybe it's the prison system. Um, maybe it's um, a cost to the family around. So we need to make sure that we are capturing the full costs um, and that we're not simply transferring them elsewhere. So. Where we're headed into managed care, and some of you may have seen this slide before because I've, I've presented it once before. Right now, we're in. Here is what we've already been doing. Um, we're increasing the sale of the services that we provide that are considered covered services to all managed care payers. Using our um, credentialing shop in Texas, we have we found we polled all of our practices and said, "What services do you deliver?" that are payable by insurance companies? And do we have contracts with all of the insurance companies in your region so that um, you're in network for all of the services that you provide? 
That's step one. Check, we've done that. Um, step two, we're in process. We're increasing the sale of specialized services for specific populations, um, and then we're gathering data on how we're do on the outcomes for these services. So some of the services that we're talking about are the local care management entity in New Hampshire that we're doing with Granite Pathways. Um, in Texas, uh, we have insurance companies that have incorporated us into bids um, for services that we've designed speci specifically for them. And if and when they win the bid in Texas, we'll be providing services that we've designed exclusively for them um, to deal with our populations who are covered by their managed care products. And then moving further up, um, we have contracts to create a network and back office support called um, management service organizations. And what we're talking about here are some state governments are encouraging providers to form provider organizations. Some provider organizations are forming independently without specific encouragement. And some of them are going in knowledgeably, knowing how to um, do some of the, the capabilities that I just described two slides ago. Some of them have the critical competencies they need to be able to survive and to contract with managed care organizations and to be able to be paid on a value-based payment method. Some don't. Some are going in very quickly without really knowing what they need. And we're trying, we are positioning ourselves to offer some of the services that we know how to provide to these, to these uh, provider organizations to help them to succeed. This will also increase our involvement in managed care. And then we're going to assume responsibility for managing the care for specific populations and be paid based on performance, value-based payment. So in other words, in managing the population, let's say, in recovery for substance use disorder, if we can show that we're effective and that we can um, manage care within a certain budget, then we would be rewarded for doing that. And then eventually moving right into becoming the insurance company and being paid on a risk-based excuse me, a risk basis from actually assuming the financial risk and managing not just the social services and not just the specific services that we that led us originally to have a relationship with those clients, but globally all of the care that they need. And so that's the direction that we're heading. When we get there, it's going to look a little bit like this. So, for example, um, here's a Medicaid managed care organization that in turn has a contract with the state Medicaid uh, program. For the populations that we engage with, they contract with us. Um, we could also contract with self-insured employer plans for their populations who have our, the conditions that we need or for commercial insurance companies for the, their populations that we're used to working with. We're not going to provide our services for everybody, but just for the populations that we know and understand. We're going to use our FedCap care management software. We're going to use uh, our FedCap, excuse me, care managers who would be peer counselors, who would be people who have direct relationships with our clients. We would use our single stop software to connect people with all the sources that they need um, other government programs to get additional income and revenue for them, uh, for, the, for their rent needs, for transportation needs. Um, we're going to use FedCap Cares as our care management software. And then we're going to build networks of providers that we will refer them to, home modification, community services, food pantries, education services, workforce development for jobs, durable medical equipment to allow them to stay in the home and not go into institutions, occupational health, again, clinical services that they need to keep uh, to, to maintain their health. Um, and we're going to be doing this for a fixed prepaid amount that would be paid for us, to us by the man Medicaid Managed Care Organization. This is the end goal of what we're driving toward when we say we're moving into managed care. And if we do this, and if we do this well, and by the way, we won't do this unless we do it well. Um, we would have local care managers that understand the clients that they're working with, that are very much in, top, in touch with our patient population and helping them to overcome the barriers to care. And the barriers that, there would be, that they would be over, helping them to overcome are not just medical, but they would be um, 
barriers to their goals that they would set. Our care managers would have care plans, life plans for them that would deal with what their ambitions were toward jobs, um, toward living independently in the community, and we would be working toward them for the whole range of their social and medical and mental health and behavioral needs. And then finally, I wanted to talk about a new possible possible role for FedCap as a trusted broker in trying to dr drive toward community solutions to removing barriers for our population. Um, a trusted broker is somebody who is seen as somewhat neutral in arriving at a solution to a problem in it that, that exists in a community. And typically, the way that the process would work is a uh, when a pro, pro, pro uh, when a problem is identified, um, at that time, a community agency, social service agency, with legitimacy in the community is appointed to try to spearhead a solution to the problem. And the trusted broker convenes stakeholders around the issue. And the stakeholders um, would be people who are looking at the problem from a variety of different perspectives. Um, and I'll give you an example in a minute. We'll work through it very quickly. A need is identified. Let's go back to the, the folks, the community with transportation problems, and folks are missing medical appointments. However that issue surf surfaces, if we use a trusted broker approach to solving that problem, the trusted broker would convene the health system that is bearing risk for the high utilization from the folks who are having transportation problems. But they would also reach out to other stakeholders. They would reach out to the patients themselves who were missing the, the medical appointments. They would reach out to uh, uh, businesses in the area who could benefit from folks who had better transportation in the region. They would, once they've identified a need and the scope of the need for transportation in, in a region that is having transportation issues, then they would work with the stakeholders to determine the impact of the need. And what they're trying to figure out is, on a stakeholder by stakeholder basis, how much is this hurting you? And how much are you willing to pay to contribute to finding a solution to this problem? And then reaching out and finding interventions. Hmm, is Lyft the solution? Or maybe we need to try to put together some budget for a private bus service? Or is there some other solution? Is there some way that we can contribute to the city putting an extra bus, a public bus service into this region? And what does that route need to look like? And what is it going to cost? And how, who's willing to pony up a little bit of money to help solve this problem? And then the trusted broker solicits bids from vendors to try the different solutions and see what works. The trusted broker from a high level is going to be allocating the cost of the chosen solution among the people who are the stakeholders who are going to benefit. Um, and if we can get a positive return on investment moving forward, finding the solution that will generate that positive return on investment, and then the trusted broker carries through the intervention, whether it's Lyft, whether it's private bus service or public bus service to solving the problem, and then takes it acts as a funding organization to collect the contributions from the various stakeholders, and then cycles around at the end to make sure that the program was carried out, and then to test the effectiveness of the solution to the problem. So this is a little bit different from our managed care conversation that was part of the rest of the problem, but I also see it as another role that FedCap can begin to play. And we're going to see more and more uh, discussion about the role of the trusted broker in taking an all-encompassing solution to some of the problems that we're seeing. So I will thank you for your attention and turn it back to you for any questions that you have that I haven't addressed already. Thank you, Robin. We only have about one moment, a uh, one minute, and so um, I'm going to ask if people want to contact you. They absolutely could. Um, if, if you're okay with that, to, um, we have. Okay, 
Um, great. I want to thank you so much for your unbelievably thorough presentation and, um, and for your willingness to share all of your information with us. And I want to thank all of you that have joined the call today. It is greatly appreciated. And there may be some questions that are even coming up right now. Um, we may stay on the board and look at it. But for the rest, thank you so much for joining us and have a great afternoon. And again, Robin, thank you so much.